That's right, yeah. Well, I tried to put out the stuff in it, too, to make it interesting. So I got the Mafia and the Communists and Ronald Reagan and all kinds of, all kinds of crazy stuff. So, actually, it's interesting. One of the top union guys that used to work for the IA and stuff, later turned in, in the 30s, turned the state's witness on, on Frank Nitti and Al Capone. <laughs> so, so they put him in the witness protection program. He moved to, his real name was Willie Byowski. And, uh, and he, um, he, uh, uh, they moved him to Phoenix. You see, the Phoenix for Flagstaff. And he changed his name to Bill Nelson and became a good friend of, uh, of uh, what's his name, Barry Goldwater and the, and the City of Commerce or something like that. And then in 1959, he went out to his pickup truck, turned the key, and exploded. Oh. Oh. Whoa. He, he, like, he was blown like a hundred. Uh, he was blown like fifty feet or something out of out of the truck. And they said that when the Phoenix police showed up, his wife, uh, when it got to the scene of the explosion, his wife had a ladder on up a lemon tree, and she was climbing up this lemon tree. And they go, you know, like, oh, the poor woman, her mind must be broken with grief. And she goes, no, it's just Willie used to have a really big diamond on his finger. And I, and I think I saw that finger fly in this tree. <laughs> <laughs> the wacky stories of animation. <laughs> Actually, when I sent the manuscript in, the, the publisher kept sending back, like, is this stuff all, is this stuff all true? And I go, yeah. <laughs> it's like, Nobody ever asks us. You know, <laughs> Anyway, all right, so yeah, my name is Tom Cito, and thank you very much for having me at all. This is fun, and uh, inviting me out. And uh, yeah, I've been an animator, I don't know how long, that's about 30, over 30 years now. And I watched the digital revolution coming. <laughs> In fact, my next book that I'm working on now is I'm writing a, um, I'm, uh, I'm writing a, a popular history of CG, because it's something that I don't understand. So I figured, you know, the union stuff, I wanted to understand more of it. And I wrote this book, and then I thought, okay, I want to understand CG history because there's so many different elements. There's like you know motion picture visual effects, and there's games, and there's and there's uh, you know you know like Toy Story and Wally -E and Panda, and then there's you know you know all kinds of different parts. But yet, it, how did it all start? You know, and it's kind of like television. You know, it's like the television. If you say who made the television? <laughs> and it's tough, it's about seven or eight people who claim it. There's a guy named Philo, Far Philo Farnsworth and John Logie Barrett in England and Deutsch's uh, uh, Kino, Kino in the 30s and, and, and Vladimir Zorkin was the guy who invented the tube. And there's like about five or six people who all say it, you know. And it's funny because I was talking to this, the curator at MIT and she was saying that she says, yeah, it's funny that, that invention in the 20th century is really messy, you know. In the 1800s, just like Alexander Graham Bell, <laughs> you know, Thomas Edison, pasture, bang, it's done, you know. While, while starting, like stuff like TV is like that, and CG is like that. You can't go, okay, this person invented CG, or this person invented, you know. It's like everybody's got a little facet to it, like one program or something. Mm -hmm. and, and what's even more confusing is that the government was involved in heart, heart for academia, you know. Because the thing is, after, during the space race with the Russians and Sputnik and all that stuff, they, um, the, the government funded this program called ARPA, which was Advanced Research Projects Agency. And they basically funneled money from the Air Force and NASA into like MIT and Stanford and University of Utah and, tried, and, and to try to create uh, you know, like these things that they wanted to use to win the Cold War. And uh, what that has to do with Toy Story <laughs> and, and, and Incredibles is that one of the things that they put a lot of money into was flight simulators. Because they said, the better realistic looking we make flight sims, mm. the less likely we can, pilots are going to fly planes into houses and stuff, because <laughs> you know, they'll be doing it in the flight simulators. So they wanted more and more realistic looking flight sims. And then there was a guy named Chris Suri in 1967, who was working for the Air Force on flight simulators, and he went, hey, I can take this stuff and animate a bird movie. <laughs> <laughs> like, and that was like a big deal, you know. You know. Or, uh, I, I was at MIT uh, a few weeks ago when we did the premiere of my series, because uh, uh, the, the premiere is out of Boston, and um, and uh, they let me look at the term paper of this guy named Professor Ivan Sutherland. And Sutherland in 1962 wrote this paper called, uh, called Sketchpad, which was the very first graphic interface the very first time you, you actually made drawings on a computer. 
because before that, computers were all just numbers. You know, like they didn't have a screen. They, they, this like ticker tape, like you know, you know, and that gave you your results. You know, and this is the first time they actually had a screen. You know, which is a big deal in 1962. You know, and what's funny was that I was reading the term paper, and and, and um, oh, oh the, the other thing is that Ivan Sutherland was the mentor and professor of Ed Catmull. Mm -hmm. Who was the current president of Pixar and mm -hmm. the current, uh, you know, you know, head of the Walt Disney Studios? So there's your connection. Mm -hmm. They went to the University of Utah. You know? wow. So that's this weird kind of government, college, <laughs> private. So you know, it's like they're all stitched together. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to suss this all out. You know, it's, <laughs> it's kind of it's it's kind of like in high school when you had to read the Russian novels. You had to read like mm -hmm. Anna Karenina. So there's always like five or. You know, four or five plots going on at the same time, and then they all kind of, you know. So it's the same thing with CG. It's like you had you had the government, and you had motion picture visual effects, and you had um, you had the games industry. Uh, you know, people tried to build ho holographic images and stuff. And then in the late '80s, they all started, you know, all kind of mushed together, and and became the big convergence. And then the digital conquest of Hollywood, which happened in the 1990s, and we're now in the post, you know, you know, part of that period right now. Mm -hmm. So it's just trying to understand that. You know, I, uh, a few weeks ago, I was up again. Up, I was up in Silicon Valley, and I, and I was hanging out with uh, Larry Cuba, who did some of the earliest CG in a movie. It's actually the first Star Wars, the 1977 Star Wars. There's one part where the Rebel commanders explain how Luke has to drop this torpedo down the shaft, and that's going to blow up the Death Star. Yeah. And it's this little graphic where it goes boop, 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 like that. That was like CG. <laughs> it's little, you know, but it was the beginning of something, you know, it was something, you know. And you know, and it's so weird, you know, because I'm sitting with this, in this guy's house in Santa Cruz, and we're just throwing the ball and stuff, talking about things. And he's got this bookshelf behind him, and then on the top of the bookshelf were like five um, huge plastic, uh, which moles of the Death Star trench. Wow. You know, like remember the motion control shot of like loops, like you know, you know, uh, tie wing fighters go, wow. you know, into that part there, and there's the trench, you know, with d with dust on it, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> I, you know, he's like, yeah, 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 <laughs> 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 you know, can I have those? Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, but it's fun, you know. See, animation people are fans too. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, like, you want to put a video on right now? Yeah, yeah. Well, what I usually like to do is I like to run my reel first and stuff so you can kind of see what I'm all about and then where I come from. Uh, yeah, what is this? Is it really pretty 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 I know it's a VHS. I was at a crew party yesterday, so I woke up this morning going, real, where's the real? So, yeah, it's funny, the last shot is kind of interesting because uh, uh, William Shatner is the voice of the little cell there and stuff. And uh, he was a lot of fun. He was a really nice guy to work with. You know, people always go, oh, William Shatner is very temperamental. No, we had a good time and stuff, you know. I got two biggest Star Trek fans on the crew that like beat her the first day, so they were whipping his ankles. And everything. <laughs> <laughs> he loved it, you know. Yeah. And it's really nice, you know, they just said, you know, Bill, at this point you're a little cell and we're going to blow you out of Bill Murray's butt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you just have a lot of fun. You know what I mean? He's great. He's great. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, so I've done you know, commercials and TV and features and things like that. I, I worked on which was, I worked on all the Disney features that don't stand, so although <laughs> <laughs> so, so dinosaurs yeah. <laughs> not my fault. You know, <laughs> you know Fantasia. <laughs> oh well, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There you go, there you go. Son of the mask, I don't know. It's a, it a job. Okay? You work on good ones, you work on bad ones. What are you going to do? You know, you know. But that, that, that's, the, that's the point, is to, be, is to just you know, do a bunch of stuff. You know? I mean, the advantage we have is that, is that right now, is that, you know, uh, I know like you're out in San Bernardino, whatever, but the thing is, you know, when you work around the world, and you work in other parts of the world, then 
you know, what the world thinks of as Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Like to them, Hollywood is everything from San Luis Obispo to the Mexican border. Mm -hmm. This is Hollywood. You know, you know, you can't go. Well, I live in Woodland Hills and I work in like Glendale. You know, and they go, no, Hollywood, Scott. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to them, everything is Hollywood. So you're in Hollywood. Yeah. You're already. In Hollywood. You already got half the battle done. You know. I mean, like, I mean, it's amazing the kind of people you know you run into like in like Boston and Florida and stuff. And go, well, someday I'm going to go to Hollywood. Like you, you know. And it's just like, yeah, you're in Hollywood already. You're already there. It's just, it's just a, you know, you got that problem solved. <laughs> you know, so, you know, you know, take the two ten west. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, and and uh, and and it's in, you know it's interesting because people, you know, when I first got in the business, it was all it was pretty cut and dry. It was just like you know you had live action, you had animation, and it really wasn't much mixture. You know, it was all just kind of like, unless he did like Honey Nut Cheerios commercial. You know, like, oh, 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 oh. you know and he did a little bird on, you know, something like that. And now, you, now there's so much crossover between live action and animation. So many different, you know, I mean, I mean, Star Wars is half animated. And you couldn't do Lord of the Rings without animation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, when I finished Osmosis Jones, um, you know, you know, my 3D crew, my, my crew 3D artists, I think like two went on to Finding Nemo, two went on to Spider-Man, uh, three went to Weta to work on um, uh, the Two Towers, Lord of the Rings. Mm. Um, and I, and let's see, I'm trying to think of it. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I said the ones went to Pixar, and then uh, uh, and then yeah, then I had uh, then it was like two others were working on another big CG thing. But I just thought it was interesting that there's this mixture, there's this crossover between live action and animation now that's fairly common. Mm -hmm. It was kind of unusual, like back when we were doing Roger Rabbit, it was just like, you did the cartoons and then the, the, the grown-up people did the grown-up films. <laughs> <laughs> it was a real movie, you know. It's interesting that like this year is like we're doing the 20th anniversary of Roger Rabbit, so it's like, wow. oh, I remember it being that long ago. You know? yeah. It's funny because when we were doing it, we thought we were doing like this breakthrough film, you know, that was like scientifically like this new technology and stuff. And we were actually doing the last of the older non-digital, you know, like the last were what they called male and female mats, which mm -hmm. is they, they used, used to take cells and, and uh, uh, you know, you take a piece of celluloid acetate and you would black out areas you wanted matted out and then you, you shot your character against black. And they put you in this machine called an optical printer, which put the two film strips together. Mm -hmm. So you could put somebody in a little in a little toy city or or put spaceships around, you know. Mm -hmm. Now you digitally do it. I mean your laptop can do it now, you know. But back then it was like it was like, like, <laughs> like a, a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was a good film. <laughs> it, it, it came out well. So um, yeah, and I think uh, uh, you know, just when it comes to like basic stuff and all, um, uh, you know, uh, besides the crossover with live action, I mean, you know, games is a really big thing now. You know, I mean, uh, up until up until about ten years ago or something, like in the '80s, games was, you know, there was some kind of like tool company, like uh, Texas Instruments or something, or Philips, and they always had like a room in the back of the warehouse where they had a couple of kids with a Preston Blair book. And, they're doing the games, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, big deal, and, you know, and, and now it's like, you know, these things that they have budgets as big as Hollywood features, and they, mm -hmm. they make more money than Hollywood features, and, uh, you know, it's a much healthier industry, you know, it employs like thousands of people, and uh, so that's a really, that's a really big alternative to go to in, in, you know, in your job as well, uh, and besides animating the effects, there's also, you know, like, you know, Mike and I come out of like doing storyboards, and uh, there's a lot of storyboard work also kind of dovetails between live action and animation. So, you know, you know because it's the same process, you know, you know of, of uh, you know, designing a film, and designing a shot, and see, you know, you know, you know which way, it will, uh, you know, how, how it will work together. And um, basically, you're sort of like the, um, the eyes and ears of the, uh, of the director, because, uh, you know, when you're taking the images, I mean, you're creating the first images. I mean, when you get it, it's a script, you know, it's just an idea. And you're giving, you're giving them the first visuals, and they have to, like, figure it out, you know. And, you know, you know even if the idea is worth doing, you know, you know, um, uh, you know I, was, I was working, uh, you know, with a guy named uh, Sid, uh, Sid Mead, 
and he's like a <laughs> famous like sort of sci-fi um, yeah. uh, you know, visual effects guy. He's like one of the greats. You know? And it's amazing because they bring these guys in very early on the production, you know, and and they say, you know, Sid, uh, uh, we want you to design a planet that's uh, inside out, and everybody's got their butts where their faces should be. And he goes, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm like, and he just does these like mind blowing drawings, you know. And then they go, no, we've changed our mind. He goes, okay. <laughs> and, you know, I'm like, and he's like a he, he's like a hired imagination. Like, he, just in, he just like does this stuff. And like, wow. and, uh, beautiful things, you know. I mean, that's a great that's a great gig to, to get. Also, you know, it's it's competitive. I mean, you know, you can't say it is very competitive. And we are working in a global world today, you know, I mean, it was before, I mean, when I started, it was like Hollywood and a little bit of New York, and that was it, you know, like, it, and so, some in London, you know, you mm. know and, uh, and, 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 you know, well, J Japan and Asian, you know, anime had always been going on, you know, you know, but the thing is that when anime, you know, only until recently, the, the Japanese have actually started to, like, have other people in the studios other than Japanese, mm. I mean, like, your idea of getting a job at, like, Ghibli or something was ridiculous, you know, because the Japanese government wouldn't do it, you know, and they wouldn't hire them, they wouldn't hire Koreans, you know, they wouldn't hire Chinese, you know, it's like, you know, they just didn't, they didn't do it because it, it was, their immigration was such a pain and everything to get a work visa and stuff, it wasn't worth their while. Mm -hmm. Now there's a lot more movement on that, on that realm, but also there's a lot more movement, like, globally, you know, I mean, we can't build walls around Los Angeles, but once you have, once you have experience and once you have, you know, an expertise that other studios want, you can work in another part of the world. You know, why not? You know, I mean, I mean, I've worked, uh, I worked in London, I worked in Taipei, I worked in Canada, I worked in New York City, and then uh, here, you know, you know, I, I was given uh, an offer to go to South Africa. I was given an offer to go to uh, Israel. You know, um, uh, I saw something in Jordan also, and. Uh, you know, it's, it, you know, a Spain, you know, there's a lot of animation, you know. It's, it just depends, you know, and, and it's, and, and really the thing is that it's up to you eventually, you know. What you really have to look for, are there any dry markers around or anything? Something like anything? Mm -hmm. I can open it to anything. I can back to the podium. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the two, the things that I always try to look for, Career-wise, is that I always started with a and the, you know so experience is very important you know because the thing is even with the schools and even with the different types of companies you can work with and stuff. Um, you know, you know, or the different types of training you get. A lot of animation, there's still a lot of master and apprentice kind of stuff happening. And if you could work with an older artist or with a mentor or something, you know, somebody who wants to like really show you the ropes, you'll learn so much extra, you know. And and uh, uh, if you work on some interesting projects, some difficult projects, then just that act of, of being involved in those processes, you you know, will also help you develop. You know, it's kind of like a. It's kind of like when you go bowling and like the guys on the, the people you're bowling with are like 250 bowlers or something like that. You immediately get better. You just start to get better because you get surrounded with like really good bowlers. You know? So it's the same thing. It's like when you surround with a really good artist, you're like, oh, okay, just do really good. You know? um, so, uh, you know, uh, the experience thing, and yeah, and I said if you, could, if you could work with an older master artist and stuff, it would tell you a lot of secrets and stuff. I mean, like one of my uh, like my masters were like uh, I worked with Seamus Culhane, who's this old uh, wow. Disney animator from the '30s. Yeah, I was his assistant. And Jeez. Stuff. We finished up together. Yeah, he was a just sweet man, and yeah. he's a lot of fun. And uh, but uh, he taught me a hell of a lot. I mean, yeah. he taught me a lot of stuff. He used to joke. He used to say, I, I mean, I guess when you when you're elderly, like you you get sort of a different um, um, a different uh, uh, standard of values. Of, uh, you know. About your work is when you were younger. Because he once told me, he says, you know, doing a good animated scene is like having a really good bowel movement. <laughs> he says, sometimes you strain and strain and it never comes out right. <laughs> Other times you sit down and ah. <laughs> 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 
said, you know, I've, I've never connected those two thoughts. <laughs> That's pretty disgusting. <laughs> um, gets the point across, though. And, um, yeah, so he was one of my mentors, and I also worked with, with Richard Williams, who was a good friend. And uh, Art Babbitt, the creator of Goofy, and all, who's a, a great teacher and friend and stuff. And um, I also worked with Ben Washam, who was like one of the great uh, Warner Brothers animators. Uh, ben always did the last shot of the, the Bugs Bunny cartoons. When, when Bugs always looked at the camera and said, and mud spelled backwards is dumb. You know, <laughs> you know, that was usually Ben. He did that. You know, nice. you know a weird thing, too, is that Ben designed the Bob's Big Boy character. Oh. Yeah, the little Bob's Big Boy. Oh. Yeah, you know, apparently the guy who started Bob's Big Boy was an assistant animator. Wow. But, and, 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 and Benny, I guess, during the Depression or something, was like a short order cook. Because he always had a toothpick in the corner of his mouth. And, stuff. Mm -hmm. just, you know, and, and he, he looked like a cook. And he looked like he had a little apron to come out. Nice. And, uh, and, and, and Benny said, he says, he and the other guy were talking, and the other guy says, you know, the heck with this animation business. Let's go into the restaurant business. I got plans for a great, you know, like a bunch of restaurants. And he's like, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, stupid, stupid. <laughs> I mean, it's weird. It's like you never know, you know, where the next opportunity is going to come. You know? and, uh, I had an uncle Charlie uh, during World War II who was in the um, who was in the, the uh, Army Signal Corps as a, a photographer, and uh, you know, did black and white photographs, reconnaissance photos, and stuff. And when he got out of the service, uh, this was in the in the New York City area. Uh, one of his friends said, "Hey, you know, uh, you know, I got." You know, if you're looking for a job, let's go down to NBC because NBC is working on this new thing called television. And most of the motion picture cameramen are boycotting it because they think it's, got, it's a technology that's going to ruin the business. You know? <laughs> so they're hiring still photographers and they're training them how to be TV cameramen. And my Uncle Charlie said, No, nah, I want to photograph babies and bar mitzvahs. <laughs> <laughs> It could have been Rod Serling by now. <laughs> a statue with the motion you know, you know, the television academy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, getting into like 1946 or something. It was just starting, you know. So I mean that's a weird thing, so you never know where the where the opportunities are gonna go, you know, where they're gonna, where they're gonna come from. Yeah. So I guess based off of that, what do you think about like the internet uh, phenomenon, flash cartoons, and like well, the technology is really available right now? Yeah, I mean it is fascinating now to see all that. Yeah, I mean there's so much good filmmaking on YouTube now yeah. and everything. And bad. It's like yeah. everybody talks about that <laughs> stuff. You know, you know. I know. So I, you know, you know, this TV series that I was doing, uh, uh, Click and Clacks, as the Wrench Turns. Uh, uh, when we were advertising originally, the 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 people doing the publicity were like. Um, and the people doing the publicity were like, oh, we got to get an interview with the Boston Herald. Oh, we got to get in the Washington Post. And I'm like, you have anything on YouTube yet? And they're like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> get something on YouTube. <laughs> I was like, well, that's what people are looking at. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, they're not cracking newspapers. They're like going on the website first. Mm -hmm. You know. But I mean, yeah, I mean, that's kind of amazing. And uh, yeah, I mean, the show I did is a Flash show. And like mm -hmm. Mike and I were saying, you know, there's, there's some nice animation in it. It's like every year Flash gets a little more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. you know? When Flash first started, it all looked like cookie cutter type stuff, you yeah. know. And uh, it looked like, like <laughs> you know, like very, very simple. And it, and each very each version of Flash gets a little more friendlier, mm -hmm. a little easier. You know? And if you can animate 2D, you can get the Flash pretty easily. You know, I, I learned it in the afternoon. So it's not a big yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so it's not hard, you know. I mean, the thing is, actually, I, I don't know enough to know how to do like a, the library of heads and the reused mouse and stuff, so I just animate them. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's the wrong way to do it, but just hand draw it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah you can but it's it. weird, you know, because like I did like an entire film title by myself mm -hmm. on my laptop, which is like crazy. You know, it's insane. You know? Yeah. And there's a lot more of that kind of stuff happening. Um, as I was finishing <coughs> this show, I mean, the crazy thing about this show was that was like, you know, yes, yeah, so years ago, you know, you'd have 60 people in a warehouse, you know, <laughs> somewhere in Sunland or something, you know, the roach coach comes and, you know, once or twice a day, you know, and that's like, you know, that's your work. And it's weird now because it's like, uh, this show, it's like, uh, um, it's written in Boston, uh, the, the Tom and Ray guys, who are the uh, radio guys, they, they recorded it in Boston, then the rest of the tracks were done in New York City, then, uh, then we did storyboard, pre-production, direction, uh, design, uh, you know, uh, timing, 
uh, all the all these elements and stuff in Los Angeles. Uh, then it was finished up in Vancouver. Then uh, the music was done by a Tex-Mex polka band out of North Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> they're really good, actually. They're very funny guys. So, like, wow. Plus, the guy can say y'all convincingly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, wow, well, guy, you know. And it's funny because they're very versatile and stuff, you know, because I, I kept saying, I said, hey, in this scene, you know, uh, uh, the character has to look like he's freaking out, like he's going crazy. So I want it to be like a 60s, uh, uh, like a 50s, like sci-fi thing. He goes, oh, all right, I'll go get my theremin. And I said, you've got a theremin? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, my, gar my garage. You know, you know, so, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, you know the theremin's one of those things of, woo, woo, woo. You know, it's this weird kind of like electric instrument. You know? Okay. You know, you know. Or like the Latin, one of the shows we did yesterday, you know, it takes place in India. And, and, and he says, oh, yeah, I know a great tabla player. You know? <laughs> so, wow. Okay. Good. <laughs> you know, so these guys are a lot of fun. You know? And then, um, and then, uh, which, and then we, we did post-production in New York. Uh, my producer was in Connecticut, and we had delivered to PBS in Washington. So it's like, so it was weird. So it's like the last couple of uh, episodes, I was directing from my kitchen. You know, like I just, I just would like, you know, you know, you know, just like take my computer, you know, like this, you know, you know, open it up, you know, just and like download stuff, write notes, you know, change a few things or two in a sketch, scan it, send it out, you know, mm -hmm. then more stuff with, you know, like listen to the music and everything, write the, you know, notes or a phone conference and send it out. And it's weird, it's like you're directing a film, you know, from your kitchen, you know. It's like, the only person I'm looking at is like my 20-pound cat, it's like asleep on the table. <laughs> it's weird, you know. But I think there's going to be more that, that type of stuff, when, you know, that kind of stuff is going on. I mean, even when I finished the Taipei project, uh, I had to come back to the States, and, uh, and I was still like approving footage and stuff, you know, via the internet. You, you know, you know, you know, at, at, at the end. And so they were working in Taipei, and I was like sending notes back. And stuff, hmm. go back and forth. Was the experience kind of seamless, like when you were working? Somewhere? Yeah, actually, yeah, it was, it was much more, it was much more seamless than I thought it would be. Yeah, yeah, I thought, I thought it would be more difficult, you know. And so I think like that kind of stuff's going to happen more often than that, you know. But I think it's a, it all, it's all goes to a place, you know. Like, like right now, it's like you're in the beginning of this process. So I always tell students, you know, it's the Hundred Years' War and you're in year one, so <laughs> don't worry, it's a fun time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, answering to the second point, too, when I talk about reputation, that's another thing, too, because animation is a very small business, and we all know each other and stuff, and, you know, you know like I said, like Mike and I worked together like 25 years ago, you know, this is it's 20 or 25, is it? It's 25. 25, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's freaky, you know. Yeah. Well, I said like Seamus told me, Seamus is in his 80s, and he goes, you know, your secret age. And I go, what? He goes, in my mind, I'm still 20. I don't know what the hell happened. <laughs> I'm not doing anything, I'm just getting older. <laughs> and I'm like, and go, oh, really? Okay, that's the secret. I was like, all right, well, thanks for telling me. You know, so that's, not really else. <laughs> that's called wisdom of the ancients. You know? yeah. But um, anyway, it's a small business, and we all know each other and stuff. And a lot of times, People uh, talk about each other's like work capabilities and disciplines and stuff. You know, it's kind of like you know, like if you were a stunt man, you know, you go like, ah, oh, Yakima, uh, yeah. boy, could he fall off a horse? <laughs> 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 like, remember when there was a guy who was, uh, was it, not Rich Harris, uh, Mike Gerard, I think, was later like a senior guy in The Simpsons. But he actually took like the he, he tried to be a stuntman at one point. He tried to like go to stuntman school, wow. and the first thing they do is they say. Get on this horse, go on a gallop, and then throw yourself on your face. <laughs> you know? So he did it once and broke his collarbone. And no, go, no. no, you're not going to be a stunt. <laughs> <Wow. coughs> <coughs> so, so don't do that. If you help, so. But anyway, um, anyway, so yeah, so I mean, yeah, if you're a lighting guy, you go, oh yeah, you're Gordon Willis, you know, you know, or, 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 you know, or if you're, you know, scripting, you know, ah, Ernst Lehmann. You know, and this stuff, you know. And these are, you know, yeah, and, and every Hollywood business has its own, you know, stars, has its own, like, top people and stuff, you know. And uh, so you want to get to that point where you're one of those top people, you know, where, they, where you know, they, they'll know you and they'll go, they won't, uh, you know, after a while you won't need a portfolio, you know. 
just walk in and just go, well, you know, I'm ready, you know, you know, uh, you know, looking for work, and they're like, oh yeah, great, you know. So it's good to keep your reputation fresh, and keep it going, and everything. And then, uh, you know, you know, and, and you're always hearing stuff like, oh, is this person good to work with? Is this person good? You know, you know, it's like, uh, he, you know, is he fast or he this or that? You know? I mean, the interesting thing about this project was that was that. Um, I was really kind of happy that most of the artists I worked with weren't late or anything like that. You know, you know sometimes you got to camp out in front of the person's house and you go, "Give me that damn storyboard! <laughs> it's been two weeks." <laughs> ah, screaming! Ah. You know, so there's always that kind of stuff. You know, you know, because the the problem is that it's not just the money; it's the time. You know, because everything's on a time factor. You know, and with with television broadcast and stuff, it's even worse because when a stu when a studio commits to airtime. You know, like, you know, you've got to show something. And if you don't have it, you can't give an excuse, you know. You have to stand up there and go, look, a dog. <laughs> you, know? Like you, got, you know, you've got to, you know, you bought that time on the air, so you better put something up there, you know. So that's why they're so manic about the time factor and stuff, and about not going, not going late. Um, and it's a high state, you know, and let's, you know, let's face it, it's not as expensive as live action, but it's still expensive. I mean, you know, feature length film is, you know, uh, you know, like, well, I mean, years ago, feature length films were like around 16 million, 20 million. Now they're like routinely around 100 or something, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, animated features like, um, like uh, uh, Kung Fu Panda, Toy Story, and, and, you know, they're usually like 145 million, and, uh, you know. Um, Ice Age was 34, which was really kind of shocking. You know, it was pretty low budget. You know, Iron Giant was about 50. You know. and, uh, and I mean, that's cheap. 50 yeah. million is cheap. <laughs> you know, and this is without even Arnold Schwarzenegger or uh, Tom Cruise taking half your budget. You know, yeah. there's a thing called the 2020 Club, which is the Tom Cruise and you know those folks because they they say I'll do it for 20 million and 20 percent of your back. You know, you know, you know which is total profit. You know, <laughs> but that's to, to get to. I mean, like Will Smith, like. Was it every movie he's been in, like nine movies, open at number one? Yeah. You know, so. Mm -hmm. In fact, the last Tom Cruise movie, uh, the one with Robert Redford about Iraq or something, you know, Alliance to Lambs or something, was the first Tom <coughs> Cruise movie in like a, a decade or something that didn't open at number one. And that was kind of a shock because that was part of his reputation, was that every movie he's in opens at number one. So when he has to negotiate from number C for money, he can say, every movie I do opens at number one. Now Will Smith can do that. He can say, every movie I, uh, you know, I'm in opens at number one, period. You know? So getting that kind of, you know, so that's why like, it's, if you work on some big projects or some big films or something, you know, like, you know, Seamus' thing was, no matter what he was doing at the time, or no matter what he's been doing since, he worked on Snow White and Pinocchio, and that's it. And for me and everything, you know, I've got Lion King and Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, you know, like those are Shrek, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I said those are mine, you know. So Richard Williams said, that's your armor. <laughs> you build armor, and then when you get more armor you have, the better you can go out there and do battle. You know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's a, you know, like anything, it's a, it's a, it's a business and stuff, but it's, it's stuff we love to do, you know, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's enjoyable work. And, uh, yeah, it's not like being a movie star, but you get to hang out with it once in a while. You know, I was I, on the Looney Tunes movie. I was like the on-stage liaison, which meant, you know, you know, I fall. I was with the live-action crew, and I was sitting in a chair between Brendan Fraser and Steve Martin with my with my drawing tablet, <laughs> and they would say, "How tall is Daffy Duck in this shot?" And you go, and you get paid. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, you know, you know, and then and then you get in this weird political stuff where it's like the producer ran over who had also been the producer of Cats and Dogs, and he was like, "Oh, you know, like this shot's not really working. You know, let's try this. Storyboard this part where they're running in and they do this and do that." So I like, draw the whole afternoon and everything, and I bring it over to the director, and the director says, "Who told you to do this?" I said, "Chris told me to do it." He goes, "Don't listen to him. He doesn't know." <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm just the guy who draws. <laughs> you know, like, there's some political fight going on between the director and the producer. It's like, well, you know, I'm just, hey man, I just do what people tell me to do. <laughs> but it's fun, you know, like, it's enjoyable for that. It's weird because we were doing, when we were doing back in action, we were like on one of the main sound stages of, uh, 
of, uh, of Warner Brothers, and um, and uh, Jenna Elfman was was there and stuff. And uh, Jenna Elfman is uh, also the the faith called Scientology. And uh, so Tom Cruise was in the next one shooting uh, last summer. So Tom Cruise used to come out and hang out with Jenna Elfman and stuff. So you know, I got to meet him and stuff. He's a nice guy. He's about, about that big. And uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Doesn't have any. It's funny. It's like it's like a, he didn't have any body hair. So he was like stripped to the waist, and he didn't have any chest hair or anything. But you could tell from his beard because his beard was like really thick on his cheeks and stuff. And he's probably a hairy guy. <laughs> so I think he's got to be doing the wax, you know. Because <laughs> so I'm looking at this beard. I've got no way, man. You don't have any chest hair. Because so, I mean, you he he had very thick black hair, very thick hair, you know, the size of him. And uh, but what's funny was we were doing like this shot that was in the Amazon jungle, and they had a um, and and so we had all these different jungle animals and stuff, and then so we had like a, you know a couple of monkeys and a couple of other birds and stuff, and then there was this orangutan, uh, this orange orangutan walking around, and we we're going, why is there an orangutan? That's not, there's no orangutan called for in the shot, and he said, no, the, he's friends with the other animals. And the other animals get upset if he's not on the set with them. Wow. <laughs> so, okay. So he's like their union rep or something. <laughs> he's like, he just hangs out. And it's just like, okay. You know. So like, it's like one day like we, we shot to like 1 o'clock in the morning. And I remember like around uh, quarter to 12 or something, I had to go to my office to get something. And, uh, and, and then as I was heading back to the stage with the producer, we saw Jenna Elfman, Tom Cruise, Brendan Fraser, and the orangutan go into her dressing room and close the door. And, and my producer goes, I don't even want to go there. <laughs> go in there. <laughs> like, don't put this on the internet. This is, this is, this is, you never heard this. I never said it. <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble. We need to edit this. A yeah, a little long, only, but I know. Yeah, they are putting this like on uh, things so. up. Yeah. Hey, that's right. It's an official lecture. I better be. I better be uh, more on topic. But I mean, you know, it's. Um, I mean, it's interesting the different kind of things you can do in the business, you know. So I said I was directing this TV series based on this radio program, mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, before that, I was working on a documentary. Uh, which I was working on a documentary about the intelligent design evolution argument, where like this one biologist wanted to do basically a Michael Moore style thing on the on the the, the, the arguments in the uh, in, in the two philosophies, but but uh, he needed animation for things that he couldn't he could they couldn't really visualize. So like uh, we had to do a, I had to do a scene to explain why rabbits eat their own food. <laughs> <laughs> so seeing it real is kind of disgusting. So, like, they actually have to, which is interesting. The, the digestive system is that the first time it pops through, it's not fecal. It's like it's like uh, it's still a a a, a, a herb, you know, it's still a, a, a grass element or something. They have to eat it the second time in order to actually get any nutrients out of it. Well, that's part of the digestive process. Huh. It goes completely through them once. Then the second time they eat it, that's when they that's when they get anything out of it. So, <laughs> so yeah, you'd rather watch a cartoon do that. You know? <laughs> so I had to wrap it on the toilet with the newspaper and stuff. Making it fun. But you know, animation has that ability to explain stuff, and, and, you, know, you know, pretty simply. And um, yeah, like I said, you know, you know, uh, God, I work for. You know, like I've done stuff for you know the Playboy Channel. I've done stuff for NATO. I've done stuff for Christian Broadcast Network. I don't know I'll work anywhere. <laughs> I have no shame at all. <laughs> Whatever you give me, okay, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the other fun thing about the experience issue and all is that the way the business is structured currently is that when you know, you know, when when we entered the business originally. And the generation before us was like the golden age generation. They were used to this idea of, of these big Hollywood plants with hundreds of workers, and you would go in and you'd spend 50 years there, you know, and you know, like like Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, you know, it's like Frank, you know, you know, got out of school at 
uh, Stanford or something, went right into Disney's, spent 46 years becoming the best artist he could, retired rich and wrote books. And I'm like, you know, sign me up. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I want to do that too. <laughs> you know? So once we did it, we got in the business, the business changed. You know, and we were like, wait a minute. How, wait, I want that business. You know, this, this one's different. You know, like what happened? You know, actually, Mark Davis is a great old Disney animator. He used to tell us, I don't know, you guys work so hard. We used to work till 11, drink lunch, and play golf all afternoon. And I'm like, I don't work for that Disney. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm working for the work your butt off Disney. <laughs> you know, like, where did they go? You know. But I mean, the thing is, the business does change. And right now, uh, to be an artist in Hollywood, it's, it's kind of like being a jazz musician. Or something. You know, it's like you're not going to have a 50 years in one place. But the thing is, you're going to go from gig to gig, and because the projects are, you know, the project specific. And then, I mean, if you get on something like The Simpsons, you know, oh yeah, it's great, 17 years in one company. That's that'd be nice, you know. <laughs> you know. But even they have turnover too, you know. Or, or um, you know, I mean, the, the you know, you go up to ILM, you know, and you see all these gray-haired guys come out like, who's he? You know? <laughs> sort of like that. And um, kind of like dogs sniffing each other's channels. You know? <laughs> who's that? <laughs> you know, like, but, um, but I mean, no, their, their thing has changed too. They moved to Presidio and they're farming out some stuff to Singapore. And, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's like there's no business that's immune from this, you know. So the thing is that you can kind of bemoan the old days or you, 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 you know, you change. You know, you know, you work with it. You know, I mean, you guys are at the beginning, so you don't have to bemoan anything. You know, you can just, this is, the, this is how the process works. But you can function, you know. I mean, people always talk about you know, I mean, the thing is, especially in, in, in school also, and, and really, I mean, not this school so much, but, uh, you know, in, in some, you know, like, uh, in some colleges, universities I work with, you know, you know, art teachers still kind of stress the Vincent van Gogh, the, 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 the creative genius against the machine, you know, all this, uh, cut your ear off and then start with death in an you know, uh, it's a little <laughs> stupid stuff, you know, but the thing is that you can still be a creative artist in the, in the, you know, you, you, know, uh, you know, in the mass media. I mean, you know, look, look at Ridley Scott. You know, Ridley Scott makes the movies he wants to make, and he works within the system. I mean, you know, his films are commercial films, but then he does the, you know, they're the ones. You know, M Night Shyamalan, you know, makes the films he wants to make, and everything. You know, he, you know that he thinks, are, you know, and he's working within the system. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who work within the system. You know, like you don't have to like, you know, stand outside and you know, uh, you know, you know, fall on your pencil. <laughs> Something like that. I mean, it's all it's all of a process, you know. And uh, we, you figure it out when you know you know when you're at, on the other side of the motion picture home. Like, Yo, I once drew a wedding. You know, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, and he's kind of like the main points. Did, did you want me to hit anything specifically, or uh, I'm, I'm easy. Uh, I think you're going yeah. in the right direction. Oh, good, good. Does anybody have any questions? Like a million. Yeah, no, bad. I was wondering, uh, since you worked at DreamWorks relatively recently, uh -huh. you know about Katzenberg's plan to like have stereoscopic 3D oh, everywhere. Oh, I know. Yeah, he's all hot for that. Right? And he wants everybody to bring their own glasses and stuff. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. wondering what you thought about that. I think it's kind of silly, but. <laughs> I don't know. It's a, uh. Well, you see, things like they, they've always been trying to figure out, like, the studios are freaking out about the um, about attendance at movie theaters. Because yeah. like nowadays, like like you know the the uh, it's it's like it's like the people the people over say from like uh, above twenty five, you know from thirty on up don't go to the movies. They stay home and they they wait for the DVD or they watch cable or something. Mm -hmm. And the people under ten or whatever like that are like doing games and stuff, you know. So the dominant audience that goes to the movies right now are what they call date packs. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, and it's just like you know, you know, you want to get away from mom and dad. You want to hang out the mall with your friends. You go to a movie. You know, and the things the studios know this stuff. They figure this stuff out like like the Normandy invasion. You know, they're like moving blocks around on the map. And it, you know, there's guys who get paid to do nothing but figure this stuff out and going, how do we, you know? And it's funny, you know, because nobody's saying, well, why are ticket prices ten bucks each? Yeah, yeah. You know, when you get the DVD for three fifty, you know, and hold it for a week, you know, yeah. do a download, you know, yeah. you know, they don't address that, you know, uh -huh. you know so let's raise the price of the popcorn, you know, and, and it's because they keep looking for alternatives and everything to get people into the theater, but yeah. the problem, so now they're on the three D kick, you know, and it's I don't know.
So they're kind of clinging to a sinking ship right now. Yeah, I think they're looking for a gimmick because this is what happened in the 50s. I mean, in the 50s with television and stuff, yeah. you know. You know, 1940, 1949, you know, you know, when Warner Brothers was, um, was, was turning out movies like Treasure Sierra Madre and, and uh, uh, you know, like all these famous, you know, movies with Humphrey Bogart and everything, their, their actual income fell by like a quarter. It was like a quarter under what it had been previous years. Their hit movie, I, I, for 1954, it was the same year they did like the Ten Commandments and all these other great mo big movies. The biggest box office movie they had in 1954 was the movie Them about the giant ants that ate Los Angeles. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you look at it now, it's really stupid. <laughs> there's this guy with this machine gun and stuff, and this this paper mache ant like. Nice. <laughs> you know, like that was like their box office jam for that year. You know? So they were they were going crazy trying to figure out how do we get people back into theaters, and that was the last time they did this big 3D thing. You know? mm. I mean, I, I don't know. I think eventually there'll be some kind of technology where you'll see, where you'll see this stuff more and around. But uh, but seeing it with with the funny glasses, I mean, I don't know how that's going to work. Mm. But I mean, I'm not I'm not deeply involved in it. Right. You know? Yeah. Where do you see 2D animation going? That's a very good question. Right. <laughs> yeah. well, thank you, I try. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's yeah, it's tough, you know, because we went through this phase, we went through this phase where where um, where you know, you know, like in the early 1990s, you know, everything was 2D films and stuff, and then 3D came on and stuff, and you have <coughs> Pixar having like now nine hit movies in a row, you know, yeah. which is kind of astounding. You know, everybody keeps waiting for them to do a flop. You know, yeah. So, guys, got to do one summer. <laughs> the law of averages, you know. I mean, we were working at Disney in the 90s, and we were turning out, like, Beauty and the Beast and Little Mermaid and stuff. You know, everybody said, oh, Disney's, you guys just crank that stuff out one after another. But actually, inside the studio, we're all looking at each other going, this is going to last. This is going to stop. I don't know. You know, I don't know if people are going to like Belle the way they like little Ariel. I don't you know. I don't you know. The, the, uh, Aladdin's much more just a broad comedy than a love story. I don't know if people kind of like it. You know, boom, you know, and so I'm, I'm sure Pixar are doing the same sweat. Mm -hmm. So they think, like, sooner or later we're going to have a black culture, you know? <laughs> 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 a treasure planet, you know, <laughs> who knows, you know, you know. I mean, I wish them all luck, you know, because, you know, the problem is the audience judges, like, uh, and, and the mass media tends to, tends to judge animation as a genre. Meaning, if you see a really lousy sci-fi movie, you don't give up on sci-fi movies. You just go, I don't like that. Yeah. So you want to see Battlefield Earth or something, <laughs> Destination Mars, yeah. Angry Red Planet. Like, oh, those, those, you know, oh, my God, it's terrible. Forgive my life. But, um, but uh, you, you know, you don't give up on sci-fi. You just go, I didn't like those films. But you know, one or two animated features tank, and right away the media is writing obituaries yeah. for the whole medium. You know, like, oh, this is the end of feature animation. You go, Oh, I just those weren't good. You know, it'll be a better one coming. You know, who knows? Yeah. You know, so, you know, but uh, to get back to the two D thing, um, the studios at one point were thinking, okay, well, it must be. So when they look at Pixar, they don't say Pixar has like one of the best story departments in the world. You know, it, it, you know, they actually raid other studios for the best for the best story guys, uh, people. They, they got all these excellent you know storytelling artists up there. It must be the computers. That must be it. <laughs> it's the computers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they go, we get a bunch of those and plug them in, and then we'll be okay. You know? So suddenly everything's 3D. So 3D this, 3D that. You know, then you get, you know, I don't want to rag on other people's movies, you know, Valiant. <laughs> Battle of Britain with pigeons. Yeah, okay. And it's not funny. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I mean, yeah, I was up for the directorship of that. And, and I read the script, and I was like, it's the Battle of Britain with pigeons. That's not funny. And it's not funny. <laughs> you know? It's like if you're gonna do the Battle of Britain with pigeons, make it ridiculous, make it Monty Python, make yeah. it so over the top that because it's absurd. It's pigeons. <laughs> you know, nobody's gonna take this seriously, you know. And they were like, no, we don't want to go in that direction. Okay. <laughs> you know? But anyway, um, so the high watermark of, of 3D, I think, was like probably about 2003, 2004, when it's suddenly like, you, you know, you couldn't get arrested if you wanted to do 2D animation. You know, you could set yourself on fire and then do 2D animation, you know. <laughs> now it's kind of came back a little bit thanks to like the Simpsons movie, 
you know, this 2D film did really well. You know, the, the, the last couple of, of animes, you know, Spirit Away is a 2D film, you know, all, you know, all that stuff is 2D. Um, and right now, um, you know, now that Pixar and DreamWorks have merged, and it's really, uh, you know, Pixar, they say Pixar and Disney merged, it's really Pixar took over Disney. <laughs> you know, they, you know, say, but all their people are basically running it, you know. Yeah. And they're doing a 2D film now just to prove they could do it. <laughs> so, they just want, so they rehired back the directors of Little Mermaid, and they hooked them up with Alan Menken, the original composer, and now they're doing this uh, Princess and the Frog. One, you know, and that's going to be two D, a two D film. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, you know, I think I find this level. And then the other thing is that two D programs like Flash, I think, are sort of getting better. You know, like right now they're at the point where they can do like really good television animation, like really full T. They can't do Disney quality stuff yet, but they're doing really full. You know that. Mode. And, and and it's interesting because with three D, what I found intriguing about Wally and then a little bit with Cars and all is when they they. They, they get in this realm where it almost looks live action, you know, mm -hmm. like those long shots of Wally like cranking around inside the landscape almost look live. And mm -hmm. I thought that's kind of an interesting way to go, you know. You know, somebody after I mean, did everybody see Wally? Oh, yeah. 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 What, yeah. Well, go see it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a write-off. <laughs> you know? But uh, that's okay. So I didn't. I didn't see Horton. I should have. Uh -huh. Sorry, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, um, the, the, I know some people said like you know, you know half the human beings that are real live action people, and yeah. the other half of the Incredibles looking stylized people, and it just kind of that, that's kind of a weird kind of. Somebody said, well, I wonder if you know, like like it might be interesting to just try and keep the human beings real. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just it's an argument back and forth. Mm -hmm. So I think. You know, when, when 2D was in really bad shape, you know, Leonard Maltin said, um, you know, it's nothing that another Lion King couldn't solve. <laughs> so, like, oh well, yeah, all we need is another Lion King. All right, that's yeah. good. You know, but, um, so it, it has come back. You know, I don't think it'll ever completely, like, dominate the way it did in the 90s, where you had, like, every studio was doing major 2D productions, you know. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's not going to happen, but it's, it's changing, you know. Like the way um, one, one CG artist once told me, he said, Remember when movies first became sound in the 1930s? Every every 1930s picture had on its title card, this is a RCA radio photophonic sound process movie. And they made a big deal about that. You know, like, here it is. And then it just became movies. You know? So some of the early CG pictures, if you look at like Toy Story 1 or you look at uh, the original, you know, Wally B or you know, some of the shorts. The, uh, the credits are all full of what software they're using, what the package is, and everything. And now it's just, you know, you know. So I think it's going the same way. I think it'll, after a while, like maybe we'll be able to tell between a, a 2D and a 3D. You know, who knows? Osmosis is kind of. On that yeah, that's we're trying to do that. Osmosis is like that. If you saw um, Millennium Actress or like any of the, the uh, what was the one? Steam Boy, uh, mm. uh, the Japanese one. Yeah. That that had a. Uh, they put 3D and 2D, you know, it's really hard to tell mm -hmm. where it goes to 3D and where it goes to 2D, yeah. you know, it's really, so, so it's interesting, yeah, I mean, the Spirited Away, when little girls running through the, um, through the flowers, fields of flowers and stuff, mm -hmm. that was all 3D, and yeah. stuff. but you couldn't tell, it's, it's masked so <coughs> nicely, you know, so I think more of that kind of stuff's going to happen, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, but, you know, the, the tough part is, everybody gets so absorbed with the technology, that like that the, the danger that we have is making sure that the that the uh, the traditions of performance and what we were taught in terms of character animation transcend to the next level. You know, because right now there's like too many people like that. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm one of those traditional animators who's not a big fan of motion capture. You know, like Beowulf and all that stuff. I was just like, I'm like. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you, know, you, you know, I thought I thought one shot of like over the hedge like was much better than you know, you know so, 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 you know, it's the Polar Express. Characters, it's like all the zombie nation. You know, I mean it's weird, you know, because it, you know, it is that thing, you know. Um, the Russian playwright Anton Chekhov said, the hardest thing to do on stage is nothing in character. Mm. 
as long as, like, like take the Hulk, you know, it's like, as long as you're throwing tanks and jumping through buildings and blowing stuff up, it looks good. When you got to stand still and act, that's hard. <laughs> that's really hard, you know. That's why, like, I like those um, Ardman things, uh, uh, Creature Comforts, the, the, the TV show, because all those characters are just talking. They're not doing anything. They're just standing there talking, but they're in character. You know, I actually like the British ones better than the American ones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was trying to tell a British friend. I said, "See, the secret is you guys like accents." I said, "Most Americans, we don't like each other's accents." <laughs> you know, like New Yorkers don't like Southerners, Bostonians don't like New Yorkers, Southerners don't like Westerners. It's like, <laughs> like, you know, I hear George Bush say.